title. Well, you know, the thing is, is that things evolve, things continuously change. And the 50 years just means that I've gone through more changes. I mean, I think. Uh, the earliest work in the show um, is a pattern done uh, before I went to college. I did it well, just, at, uh, in, just in high school, really. And uh, it's done with spray paint. And I was aware of what I was doing. And I was interested in uh, evolving patterns back then. And I'm still interested in it. So the reason we put, obviously we put that picture in because it does pertain to a lot of the late work, although it was done way, 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 way ago, way, a long time ago. And you know, the, the point is, is that so much of what I do, um, I work on over a period of time, you know, like for instance, in the cosmology, uh, in the original cosmology from the, from the seventies, uh, I, I have, um, after I die, I am in a semicircular corridor and fate and death decide if I go up to heaven or down to hell. Now, the question I've been having ever, for, ever since then, and I still don't understand it, is why is it a semicircular corridor? What does that mean? But only in time will this, uh, this comes up. And so these kind of odd questions that have have been in my head for 50 years or 45 years, I'm still trying to figure them out. And they come up at odd moments, the answers. So in a way, 50 years is a long time to answer certain questions and to let the subconscious uh, you know, uh, pull the weight and then pop in later on. You know? So it, it's just, it, it, just it, it kind of um, defines the journey, Descri not defines the journey, but describes the, the temporal aspect of the journey. Well, you just mentioned this 1970 airbrush uh, drawing. And it's yeah. interesting, in a way, it's like prefiguring charts. It's like a structure. It doesn't represent a, a figure or a landscape, whatever, it is a structure. And on the other hand, it's made indirectly. A, an airbrush you had a stencil or something to, to do this work. It's a little bit prefiguring also the rubbings. I mean, you work indirectly and not just as a classical painter would do just doing an airbrush drawing. Yeah, you know, I was making a lot of work uh, back then. I mean, countless notebooks. I was really just becoming an artist and, and I was trying a lot of different things. This evolving pattern, this pattern that grew was something that I really felt and I wanted to participate in. This is before my knowledge of conceptual art. Uh, that happened within months of this time, but this was before that. And uh, I was aware of pop art. Of course, I was aware of Warhol and you know, the serial image. So all of that was available. I think, you know, so th these, these, uh, that was there. But my interest in this evolving pattern back then was so subconscious. And, uh, and it's still interesting for me. It still is inter interesting for me. It's still there. And it's fun to see it in this kind of exhibition where you can see one pattern behind another. because if you look at that wall where that picture is, if you look through the door, you see this pattern that I did two years ago, uh, you know, which is really all I see are light patterns. That's, that's, uh, that's another, that's another uh, point of view, which emerged in the late seventies, really that statement. Well, for people visiting your exhibition, it's a very long way from the airbus drawing to a cast to uh, uh, rubbing and to many other uh, types of work. And the question is suddenly be, being asked, what is the common denominator of, the, of all what is here? Is this a structure? Is it the fact that these are all signs? Or how would you, how would you say, what is the common denominator of it all? Uh, you know, I, I was talking to Victor this morning and he said that, they, that, that, that uh, uh, people are confused. They don't quite understand what I'm after. You know, it's a complicated intellectual, kind of investigation. But what I'm trying to do is to get to the base. You know, I'm trying to do the simplest thing. And, and, and in doing that, it becomes, it's just the world opens up and it becomes so complicated. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, basic questions about, okay, pictures. What is a picture? What's the difference between a picture of something and the reality of that thing? really basic questions. But if you start to ask these questions, the world opens up. You know, you're going through the mirror into the image world 
and things plop all over the place. Uh, it, it, but I'm trying to do something really, really simple, which is really to try and understand what we're doing as what, what does art do and why is art done? And what is, you know, those are really basic questions. And I'm, and I'm trying to understand that. When you see the, the, the pictures on the wall, on one level, they are signs, but all pictures are signs. All pictures are mental. Doesn't matter where they are or where they come from. I think Leonardo da Vinci said that all painting is mental. It, 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 it's, it's magic. It's, it's it, I think, something like that. And, it, and, and Philip Guston, you know, was talking about this as well, that the, the painting is not in the paint. It doesn't exist in the object. It, un, it, it exists in its sign. It exists in its meaning. And the meaning is only in the mind, only in the mind, from one mind to the other. It does not exist physically because we don't see the physicality of it. We are blind to the physicality. I mean, so, and I'm just trying to figure this out. It's, 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 and then figuring out something so basic, it just seems very complicated because I'm challenging, I'm challenging things that we take for granted. And if you start to take those things apart, it becomes confusing because we all have roadmaps. We figure things out in a very particular way. And, and, and this is different. I'm trying to break those, that roadmap up to understand it. I mean, it doesn't even, uh, it's not even necessary to go back to Leonardo. I'm thinking of artists of the more recent past. Do you think, <laughs> Leonardo. Do you think that you were, in a way, uh, is the, the, the way that Sole Witt, for instance, also thought there is a structure and the works are just manifestations of a structure. Or Lawrence Wiener, there is a structure and you can build it, you can build it this way or that way, or somebody else can do it. Yes. Understanding yes. the art as a structure and the manifestations then happen afterwards. Would you think this is familiar to what you're doing? Do I think of what I do is uh, in relationship to Lawrence Wiener and Solo Witt? From the same family, let's say, or from the yeah, same... Yeah, of course. I am an offspring of those guys. I mean, come on. I mean, also Hannah Darboven, who I think is a wonderful artist, mm -hmm. and she plays on something else. But, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all friends. I mean, those three artists, and they're, they're wonderful people uh, and wonderful artists. Uh, I even collaborated with Lawrence uh, uh, more than once uh, on projects. And, but, you know, that is, in a way, what that did was that what they did was to, to take the pressure off the object, you know, up to that point, you know, the art object itself was really, the, was, was really where it all was. And what they did, they said, no, the art object is defined by its context and um, and that context is what we do. And we, as long as you as you can represent the context in any way possible, you are going to be there. I, I understand that. And um, but it's still very rich. This 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 territory, you, you could say. Um, you know what the difference is. You know, if I was to start talking about the differences between myself and and say Saul Lewitt, you know, this is there's a lot, but there's a whole big difference in in, in the way we handle things. Yeah. Of course, I relate to them, and and I with Lawrence as one well. One thing would be that Saul would never have spoken of the unconscious. I yes. think there's another. No, not Lawrence as well. I think that's another background of yours. That's there's surrealism, American surrealism, but the unconscious. American, I mean, not just American surrealism, surrealism, and you know, the surrealists were the last. I think the last group, big heavy group, that dealt with that 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 idea. I mean, in a sense, what is the subject? Um, you know, the subject of the world. If you really start going into the world, you have to enter the subjective. You have to go into the psyche of the of the person. And the surrealists were really uh, having going into the subject. I, as an artist. I'm very much interested, more interested in the subject than I am the object. I'm not, I'm, I'm less interested, I'm not a formalist. I never was a formalist. Um, I, uh, the forms that, and I'm not interested in the form of art per se. Uh, this makes my work a little bit uh, problematic. Uh, that the fact that I'm, I'm interested in this, I, I'm interested in the psyche. And, and as 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 a, as the base of our experience in the world, yeah. and 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 going into the psyche. So I have had people 
that look at my work and say, but you're just a surrealist, you know, but that's that, and, and they had issues with my work that way. Um, you know, that's because they're formalists. They want form. I, I, some of my galleries, they, they, they're, they're, they're scared of the work. They're scared of the work because the fact that, you know, that, that the work is so much about the wetness of the psyche, you know, the subconscious, you know, the hypnosis is where I'm out there and I'm, and I'm just, I'm, I, I am totally, uh, I'm almost unconscious yeah. to that point. You know, I'm almost unconscious. People will be surprised to find in your early drawings, demons and angels, souls, heaven and hell, fate and death. I mean, figures from religion or from, from mythology. And this is surprising yes. for uh, right. 80s, 80s artists. So what, what, how, how did you choose these, these figures? This, this, this is, both my parents, I, I have to say, were artists. Yeah. My mother just died a month ago and my father, you know, 20 years ago. But the thing is, is that I grew up in, 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 in a house filled with objects that they collected, oceanic object, you know, New Guinea, whatever. And it was all considered art. You go to the Metropolitan, you go to the, that wing of the Met where you have the New Guinea project and all that stuff. And, and, but none of that stuff was considered to be art. Uh, that was all considered to be, it was medicine. A lot of that stuff is medicine. It, it's all done with, and it's all cosmology. And so I thought, well, what is the highest form? What, where does art really, if you go back in time, uh, where does art take you? And it takes you there. You go back into any culture on the planet and you go back far enough, it goes there. It goes to the, the cosmology. It goes to this idea of uh, notation of heaven a notation of hell, a notation of the future, a notation of the past, not necessarily physical, but, but, but metaphorically. And, and so I wanted my work to deal with that. It was a taboo. It is still a taboo. I remember there was a gallerist, a famous gallerist that wanted to work with me, but did not want to work with that part of my work. He was interested in my signs and, and he was interested in the flags and and all of that stuff and the pictograms, but he was not interested in heaven for sure. It really upset him. <laughs> and, and so, you know, how many artists are out there really talking about this subject? And it's so basic to, to the human condition and so basic to the political condition of our world. When you think about what's happening in the Middle East where you have different views in conflict and, and when you get down to it, those views are not about you know practical matters, but they're about about metaphorical, symbolic, uh, religious matters. It's very and 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 I would I'm surprised there's not more people talking about this. But I am breaking down what the op, the possible object is. What is an art object? I have to refer to to heaven. I just have to refer to all of that. Uh, I went to Cal Arts. I studied with John Baldessari and, you know, my fellow students were James Welling and David Sally and Barbara Bloom. And we were all in the class together. The taboo, I, the, when I went to, ha when I started doing this stuff about heaven, it, it's taboo. I couldn't do it. You could do anything, but this was complicated when I went there because it's not just about being funny. Uh, you know, there's an aspect of humor in that work, but it's not about that. It's really about You know, I was having a discussion with Helene Weiner about the possibility of what a sign can do and a sound, how a sign represents the soul. And she tells me flight, just perfectly straight. I don't believe in souls. I do not believe in souls. They do not exist. It's only, it's only the nervous system. Souls do not exist. You know, so this is, this is you know, so what, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? You mentioned the term cosmology in your talking, and cosmology, <laughs> as I understand it, cosmology is a model. Cosmology is not the real thing, it's not the world, it's not the universe. Cosmology is a model for a potential world or for, for a thinkable or for a conceivable world. And I think uh, your work, in fact, is modeling something, isn't it? Like, yes. Yes, absolutely. It's a model. You know, my model, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a model of a, of a cosmology, which I don't believe in as a religion. You know, I, I, it's a model. It exists only as a model. Uh, and a cosmology is a social, uh, uh, a social phenomenon. 
It doesn't exist uh, without the social aspect It doesn't exist. So my cosmology is not a cosmology because I'm the only one that somehow represents it. Um, it refers to others, which are much more, you know, grand, uh, but it, it, my work is more of a cosmogony than, than a cosmology. Um, and also the question is, are the five worlds a cosmology as much as the demon and angel? Um, this is, a, this is another thing. I've never looked at the five worlds as a, as a cosmology so much, although you know they could be read that way. But it struck me that in your cosmology or in your worlds, you always seem to be discovering things. So this yes. cosmology has been set or formulated by you, is offering things which you don't know beforehand. So it's richer than what you also of the cosmology can, can yes. Discuss. Yeah, the, the subconscious is quite wonderful that way. And the way that you represent ideas without necessarily understanding the whole of that idea. And that in time, as I said, 50 years, you learn more about what you're after. Because we, you know, the way the mind works, one of the, one of the things I'm really interested in and have been interested in is so what is thought? Uh, how do, what, what, it, what does it mean to think? Uh, what, what, what do we, when we are thinking, what do we think in? Do we think in pictures? Do we think in words? Uh, do we think in feelings? How do we think? And if, if, if I'm already kind of being troubled by this, of course, meaning comes up not necessarily, you know, in my dreams or in, you know, uh, you know, inspiration and, and, and momentum that way, uh, they come up weirdly. And so in time, this comes up. Uh, and, but those are questions that I'm very much interested in, how things evolve, how things change. Now, very early in your work, you bring up the term fiction. And there's a very nice drawing here in this exhibition just a space described with the barest few lines, just three lines saying, this is the corner of my fictional studio, 1974. And yes. you were sitting in a real studio then, and for, what, what did it mean to, for you to describe, to draw a fictional studio for yourself, or for whom? Well, um, I wanted to enter the picture. I wanted the picture to be a real thing. I was interested in breaking down uh, the, the, this notion of, of experience within the picture. I entered the picture in 1973 and I walked around in it. So I wanted to define that place that I experienced uh, that was not a physical place. It was, it was a fictional place and really to fill it out because so much of our experience of the world exists within pictures and within a fiction of sorts. I was just going into it and showing the detail of the fiction because somehow details of something uh, uh, represent the, the, that reality in a fundamental way, in a way that is, it's almost like when you pinch yourself in a dream somehow uh, to see if you're awake or if it's real or not. Uh, the, the detail of the place somehow just points to, to a larger context that you're a part of. People used to think that the fiction was like entering a dream or, or you know, uh, but it, it, I was entering the picture. But what is a picture? So if I say a picture is a manifestation of the mind, then I'm going into my mind when I, when, 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 when I do that simple drawing of this imaginary studio. Glenn was a figure in that imaginary studio. Glenn pinched his arm in that imaginary studio and he felt the pain. I was interested in the, the, the pain that Glenn felt in that imaginary studio. Are, are, there, are there different uh, levels of reality or different levels of fiction, or is it uh, uh, possible for you to distinguish between reality and fiction at all, or is this just flu? Well, we always, yeah, we wake up. I mean, we, our bodies are, are, you know, our bodies have a feeling and we know we're in our bodies and we know that we are in a particular room. I'm in my basement right now in Southampton, New York. Um, you know, where I'm working on, on my stuff down here. I know where I am, uh, so I'm aware of that. Uh, but when you start taking things apart and you start like trying to 
to understand it, then you start getting into kind of odd moments. Uh, and, and then it becomes much more interesting. Like, um, but, and, and when you start breaking down the realities that you're in, at the five worlds, you know, there are five worlds in my work. I mean, there's the materiality, which is the, uh, the physical reality of where I am. And then the, and that would be the elements. So that's not the wood in the room, but the, the, uh, the you know, the, the, not the room itself, but the, what the room is made of. Uh, in my basement. And then there is the world unframed, which is one step above where I'm just in this room working and I'm doing my stuff. And then the room becomes interesting and that's framed. I start thinking about it in a different way. And then the next is the sign where the room itself is a, it has a representation. It is can be used in a poster or in a sign. And then the top is how I feel in that room. Uh, separate from the room itself, you know, how comfortable I am in that room. So, you know, so at one level, my subjective feeling of being in a space uh, represents one way. And then on the other level, it's the physicality of that space, you know, uh, as separate from me. So the objective is on one end. So, uh, and the subjective on the other, you could say that on what at the bottom of my chart on the bottom of it, is, 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 is physicality without meaning, no meaning whatsoever, end of meaning, that's the bottom. On the top is meaning without physicality, only meaning with no physicality at all. Those are the bookends of my five worlds. Those are the, the top and the bottom. As you drew the five worlds in many charts and there are some of these charts in the exhibition and a very particular chart is just behind me where you project this chart on a sphere on the ball, mm -hmm. this same yes. interesting paradox that the chart has its borders and is very clearly defined and the sphere has no boundaries. The sphere has an, its kind of surface. And so there's a paradox like the chart being projected on these balls, on these spheres. We did this before on uh, glass balls, which you drew upon. And here now a, there are four rubbings describing various charts, uh, oh, charts being projected in various ways on a sphere. Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing about it is that a chart, you know, my chart of heaven, of, of where you have the subjective above and the elements below, and you're in the middle looking up or looking down, and that's a chart that's the, that's the same chart, but done with a top, bottom, left, and right. But when you project it onto a sphere, what happens is that there's no top, there's no bottom, there's no left, there's no right. Um, it, it, it abstracts it into a place. Um, that's, that's, that's what happens when, and I wanted to just break down because people thought that it was a hierarchical chart and I wanted to kind of express the fact that it was not a hierarchical chart. It's not like one is above the other necessarily, they're different. And, and this is the, 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 the sign of putting this three, this two dimensional surface on a, on a ball and in a perfect way is, is the representation it was done on a computer. I've been drawing it for, you know, since the 90s, the mid 90s. Uh, and uh, then it, and it's interesting that when we did it with the computer, I, there were such surprises there, such surprises in the way that that looks. Well, that leads me to this other work, which is in the same room where I'm sitting, the virtual reality, the spectacles you look through and you are yeah. in, the ball, within the ball. So you you're in the ball developed this with the help of a computer, of an IT person, or how did you? Right, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, there was someone in Berlin and they, they, we, we told them what we wanted and we could go into it. It's a very simple virtual environment. I wanted it to be almost emblematic in itself and that you're inside this and you can start to read it from the inside out that versus from the outside in. It's a completely, to be the, when that ball is surrounding you, what it's doing is it's mimicking your point of view. That whenever, whenever you are, wherever you are in a room, if you look all around you and look above and below, you're inside it, which is very different from looking at a ball in front of you and, and, and turning it around. It's a completely different relationship. And that's what the virtual can do. It puts us inside the picture. And that's something that I've been doing, oh my God, since I wanted to, when I, when I entered the picture in 1973, when I went into the Paranese print and I walked around in there, it's very similar to that. But this is an emblem 
that represents the five worlds that you're inside. And it's a very simplistic, almost modern looking uh, object from the inside out. It looks like color field paintings, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that's, that's something that I wanted. I wanted that. But the virtual reality, I did one of the very first virtual environments, period, 1991. I did it with the French Ministry of Culture. Cities. Uh, the cities. What? He's got the cities. The, the city. Which yeah, you... the, yeah, the city. That's the five worlds. But the city, but, you know, and then most of that, most of that world is abstract. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but only then one air and one of the five cities, is it becoming quite uh, quite looking like a city, but only one of the five worlds looks like it. The rest do not look like a city. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, I call it a city, but of course it's not a city uh, it, because no one lives there. <laughs> it, it's not even, it represents, uh, uses the structure of a city in order to, de to, to define the cosmology or my five worlds, that's all. You know, the, this virtual reality work coincides with these new watercolors you're doing on wood. And I think that's mm -hmm. fascinating the whole show that all the different medias which are here and at the same time you're using virtual reality, you use the most classical medium there is watercolor. So yeah. maybe we can close our conversation with, with some comments on, the, on these recent watercolors and wood. Uh, you know, I, the watercolors, you know, I was doing them on paper and I did, you know, and, and the watercolors really come out of uh, these gouaches, which I did in the 80s and mid 80s, I did these gouaches and they're all of heaven. So all the watercolors come out of this representation of heaven. And um, so it's very, and they're balls. And that comes out of a performance. See, if you really get into it, I, I, it's a performance that I did um, in, in the 70s in hall walls where I went to the edge of heaven. And when I went to the edge of this was a drawing of the edge of heaven. And I put my mind's eye into that drawing and I walked around and I got to the edge of heaven and it was completely wrong. Heaven was a ball that I was inside of. And as my feelings changed, what I saw changed. So what happens is the reverse that the world creates feelings. I, in this situation, feelings create the, the, the world. And so, and that was the beginning of, of all these bald pictures. Um, and then more recently, I wanted to do them in black and white and it represented the cosmology. And, and what happens is I've never painted with watercolor, only with gouache. So watercolor is almost atmospheric in the way it defines a space. Uh, because you have this multiple layers of very thin levels of, of wash and it creates, it's like the weather, you know, watercolor is closer to the representation of atmosphere because it does use water in a similar way that atmosphere is viewed at you. What we see in clouds are wet. That's what we're looking at, atmosphere. And it's kind of like that. So it makes sense that the watercolor would become more and more important. And it's so basic uh, for me, it feels wonderful to, uh, to, for me to, to, to do them. And it refers to, you know, uh, Victor Hugo's did beautiful ink washes in the, in, in the 19th century and, and, and Redon as well. And, and, and it has that quality for me, which I really like this not knowing it's kind of half there. So they represent something which is not fully articulated. Whereas with the virtual, it is so hardcore. It is so completely different. Like the rubbings themselves are also going back. You know, that's the, they are the first form of reproducible media. I refer to them as that. And, and so it really, to a little extent, a big extent in the show, it's the representation of media that's very important, you know, between the watercolor, the virtual, the rubbing, even the tiles that are, uh, that are upstairs, you know, that's used in, in, uh, in, in bathrooms. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a form of building. Or the stained glass, you know, so many. But I feel like I could, or the carpet, the, the tapestry downstairs or upstairs. Uh, it's very, you know, it's again, it's, it's, it's like I'm removed from it. Yeah. I'm removed from it. The way you move from one work to the other shows the deep coherence and uh, homogeneity of, of all what is here. And of course, a short conversation is not enough to cover 50 yeah. years. <laughs> 
but I think we brought up some ideas and subjects and thank you very much, Matt. I think we have to close Okay, here. we did our 30 minutes. Good, yeah, good, 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 good. Thank good. you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.